So this is the last of the six lectures I'm going to be giving you. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about polyploids in breeding and domestication. I'm assuming that most of you are familiar about what a polyploid is. Um, it's basically when we increase the uh, haploid sets of chromosomes beyond uh, the diploid level. Uh, the diploid is probably the more natural type. Uh, but what you find in domesticated crop species is we have um, a lot of polyploid crops. Uh, that is not necessarily the natural state of the wild relatives in many of these cases. But there's typically two groups of polyploids. The first one is autopolyploids. So when we get reduplication of the genomes, um, they basically carry the same or nearly the same sets of genes. So basically the duplication is um, pretty much consistent where you have similar genetic sets. Um, in the case of allopolyploids, we tend to have a combination and reduplication where we get two separate uh, diploid genomes in, in essence, um, which don't readily recombine with one another. Uh, but they, they basically then go on to replicate as distinct sets where um, in a tetraploid the A will bind with the A and the C with the C. So in the case of order polyploids, we may deal with crops such as um, leek or alfalfa. Um, in the case of the allopolyploids, we're dealing really oftentimes with amphidiploids or two separate diploid sets. Um, this would be the case in wheat or canola. Some issues that we can also deal with on a chromosomal level is aneuploidy. Um, this is when we have uh, an extra chromosome or we're missing one chromosome. This can appear quite a lot when we try to manipulate polyploids in breeding, so it's really um, important to realize the problems that this can cause. So if we look at polyploidy, in certain ways, two sets can be better than one, or two in many ways is always better than one, but there's a lot of things that we need to take into account if we're looking to, for instance, kind of manipulate these genomes in this kind of way. And we also have to take into account what we're actually trying to achieve when we work with polyploids, when we're working with polyploid crops, or when we're perhaps even trying to generate um, new crop species or different types of market classes of crops. Some of the uses of polyploids from a breeding basis are firstly the creation of um, new crop species or perhaps uh, new market classes. We might take a crop that is um, being domesticated as a diploid but we might be able to double the chromosomes to a tetraploid. We might be able to produce a whole new market class of that. In some cases, um, we can create whole new crop species through allopolyploids, for example. Some of the benefits, particularly relating to horticulture of polyploids, is that a polyploid cell tends to be bigger. And correspondingly, you can tend to have bigger plant parts. The plants may not be fitter, but oftentimes when we look at domestication, this comes through in um, such qualities as larger seed size, uh, larger fruit size, or larger size of the plant generally. So through domestication, you can see how uh, polyploids might have occurred during domestication because if people are going out and harvesting fruit crops or, or harvesting some crops, then they might just naturally try and go and pick the biggest one. And then during the course of domestication, they're actually picking out the polyploids by doing this. 
In some cases, by producing polyploids, you can improve a number of the traits. Quality is certainly a trait that is associated with some polyploids, uh, but we have other traits that are important that I will come into during the course of the lecture. Yep. Do some. Plants generally are tolerant of being polyploid. Um, it does vary from species to species. Some will more readily become polyploids than others. I'm sure there are some plant species um, that people have not been successful in generating polyploids with. Um, I know work has been done with tomatoes, uh, with culture seen that has not been particularly successful. Um, probably the crosses or the, the plants that are more amenable to outcrossing are going to uh, reduplicate perhaps a little bit better because outcrossing crops tend to be more tolerant of genetic change because they force that crossbreeding strategy. Um, this is also true of crossing outside the species. With, with outcrossing crops, you generally have a wider range of species that you can cross to than self-pollinating types. Um, but as I briefly mentioned uh, last week, we can also create polyploids for a number of breeding strategies. For instance, if the crop we're working with is a domesticated um, polyploid, perhaps a tetraploid, um, but we want to work with a trait that may be in one of the diploid relatives, then for the breeding strategy, it may be better to convert that diploid into a tetraploid before we start doing our crossing program with it. So when we talk about naturally occurring polyploids, yes, they've occurred naturally, but they've been selected because typically of issues like their fruit traits. Um, so they've really come about in, in a large respect through domestication rather than through natural selection in many cases. Um, we have a number of triploid crops, uh, banana, planting, uh, tetraploid, where you have the four haploid sets, such as durum, wheat, alfalfa, but we can start going up to even hexaploids or octoploids. So we can actually have some plants that will sustain a large number of um, haploid sets. Yep. No, I think okra is different from okra. I'm not actually sure what okra is. Oats, I believe, are octoploid as well. Um, maybe, maybe that is a mistake because okra probably is an octoploid. Has anyone heard of okra? Yeah, okay. So okra is a different plant from an okra then. <laughs> Glad somebody knows that. Um, a lot of this reduplication can um, just occur naturally, as it has during the course of domestication. So if we look at the case of uh, Triticale, which was a new crop species that has been generated by combining uh, durum wheat and rye, Sicale uh, cereale, then when this is crossed, we basically pick up the AB haploid genomes from the durum wheat and the R genome from the rye. And when we get the combination of these, they won't recombine with another, with each other. But you can get chromosome doubling where you end up now with basically a hexaploid with three sets from the double A, double B, and the double R. This can also um, in a breeding program be pushed through culture scene treatment, which I'm going to cover in the next slide or two. But it's an example of a new crop species. You probably have covered the domestication of wheat during this class. Um, most of the wheat that we consume is bread wheat or triticum east of them and durum wheat, which we would use to produce uh, pasta, for example. The origin and evolution of wheat goes back to diploid species, 
Triticum monococcum, Aegilops boloides, and Aegilops sclerosa. So during the course of domestication of wheat, we've had a natural hybridization into the tetraploid Durham wheat. And then we've ended up with a further cross, which has ended up then as a hexaploid, allopolyploid hexaploid, which is the bread wheat. Another thing you can notice from this picture is as we go from diploid to tetraploid to hexaploid, we also start increasing the seed size. I showed you this slide last week briefly. Um, it's the triangle of U or the Brassica triangle. Again, we basically have during the origin, evolution, and domestication of crop species, we've basically ended up with Brassica species that have a haploid chromosome or haploid genome set with eight chromosomes, in the case of Brassica nigra, a haploid set of nine chromosomes, in the case of Brassica oleracea, and a set of ten chromosomes, in the case of Brassica rapa or Brassica campestris. This forms the triangle where they have this similar origin and evolution. So. A lot of these species have basically arisen from um, a distant relative that is thought to have been um, to have six chromosomes. So they really represent, even though they're considered diploid, they represent a lot of duplications and um, replications within these genomes that have basically created an ascending series of aneuploids that over time have become um, considered as diploids. Now, all of these share very similar genetics. Um, and what has occurred from these three um, pseudo-diploid species, if you like, is that we've also had a whole series of amphidiploids that have been created from the relative combinations. So when Brassica oleracea has crossed to Brassica nigra, uh, this has ended up as Ethiopian mustard. With Rapa crossed to um, nigra with Indian mustard or brown mustard. And in the case of oleracea times Rapa with Brassica napus. Brassica napus is now the primary source of canola. Uh, canola is a Canadian oilseed rape that has a very high oil proportion of a certain type. So we can actually harvest um, canola from Brassica rapa as well because that refers to the actual um, oil quality in essence. But Brassica napus is um, for the most part oilseed rape, which is canola, um, or also vegetable crops such as Swede and rutabaga. So there's a whole host of crop species that have really um, arisen through this kind of relationship. And a lot of them through these uh, polyploid events creating the amphidiploids. You don't always get um, a direct comparison like this, you know, if you were to take uh, turnip or Brassica campestris and take cabbage, which is Brassica oleracea, you might well end up with something looking like rutabaga. You're not going to end up with the exact thing. But basically, by crossing these two diploid and selection, selecting a polyploid or amphidiploid out, we can end up with entirely new market classes or crop species. Um, in the case of the autopolyploids, a lot of these um, are naturally occurring. There's a number of crop species on the marketplace that are, um, such as alfalfa, um, leeks. They, they've just basically duplicated the diploid set of chromosomes, which may have resulted in 
uh, larger harvestable parts in them, for example. But they can also be induced. So in a breeding program, it's possible to perhaps take a crop type that hasn't been domesticated as a tetraploid, that has perhaps been domesticated as a diploid. And by using approaches such as culture scene doubling, actually creating tetraploids of these types. Um, in the case of ryegrass, which is something I worked with a number of years ago, um, a number of tetraploid varieties of ryegrass had been developed. Now, ryegrass can be annual or perennial, but it's typically used as forage grass. Uh, the tetraploid varieties that they created through culture scene treatment, uh, they did look like they were much more robust and had a lot more vigor when they were growing, but this was a lot to do with the larger cells of the tetraploids. They didn't necessarily have any more nutrients in them, even though they were bigger. They were taking up perhaps a lot more water. But the benefit of the, the tetraploid ryegrass was that um, livestock could more easily digest the grass. And so by having these larger cell tetraploids, uh, you had less bloating, etc., in the livestock as the course of feeding with the forage grass. Um, in the case of grapes, this has also been used to create tetraploids. Um, in this case, this is primarily for size, for increasing the actual size of the berry in the grapes. And some of these are relatively new, and Bruce Reich, who's our grape breeder, is working on some tetraploids as a means of moving to market, because oftentimes you not only increase the fruit size, you also increase the quality for the consumer. How do you generate polyploids? Um, oftentimes, they just occur naturally, and it's a means of trying to identify what is polyploid and what is not polyploid. It is also possible to use some techniques to achieve this. Um, culture scene doubling of the uh, chromosomes was hailed as the next revolution in agriculture in the 1950s that was going to completely change agriculture forever. But as with many new techniques that are brought into agricultural research, they oftentimes apply and work well in a small number of crop species, uh, but perhaps not in the majority of crop species. Culture scene treatment has been used and continues to be used, but it's being phased out as a chemical now because um, it is extremely uh, poisonous. Um, it comes from the autumn crocus. It's, uh, it's a very old poison. Uh, I think hemlock that may be related to it in some respect. I think it might also have been used as a treatment for gout back in the Middle Ages. Um, but basically, it's applied to the growing meristem. It can be applied either to the shoot apex, or in some cases, when I was back in Aberystwyth, um, they were also applying it to the root meristem. The meristematic region of the plant is where you have all of the reduplicating cells, of course. The meristem is typically at the shoot apex. In the case of crops like uh, grass, it has a basal meristem. So that's why you can mow grass, because the meristem is at the base of the leaf blade. Uh, but you also have meristems right at the growing point of the root. Um, by treating with culture seam, um, it's possible to select out a small number of tetraploids and tissue culture these. The vast majority are going to be diploids, but it, um, 
it is possible to select tetraploids using this approach. Some other approaches that are being used include temperature shock and x-ray. Um, and also, I think some herbicides can be used to, um, to arrest the spindle formation, basically um, allowing the, uh, the chromosome sets to double. You're probably all familiar with mitosis, interphase, um, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, um, as the chromosomes double and then split. As it's moving from metaphase into prophase, um, colchicine affects the, um, the spindle development that's holding the chromosomes, and it, it prevents the chromosomes from splitting during telophase. So they remain in the same, uh, they, basic, they, they basically move from anaphase right through to prophase again, and this is what calls the, causes the tetraploid event. So it, it disrupts the cell division during mitosis. As far as identifying these, um, this can be done in traditional ways, like doing chromosome counts under the microwave. Um, the easiest approach is probably using flow cytometry. A couple of you may have some familiarity with this. Um, it's an approach where you can just grind up some tissue with some stain, and the machine basically um, channels all the nuclei down to one cell and then it's able to take a measurement with the stain of the size of the nucleus. So it's a very, very quick way of reading. The, it, it's not fantastically accurate, but it's a very quick way in the fact that you could test maybe 30 plants an hour for being polyploid. Um, here's a diagram that I pulled off the web to illustrate it in a crude way that the terminal bud treated with colchicine um, ends up with part of the plant uh, becoming tetraploid with the corresponding larger fruit type in this case for illustrative purposes. As far as uh, microscopy goes, um, very traditional approach, but it is possible to um, stain and be able to differentiate the diploids and the polyploids just by looking at the stage at which the uh, chromos chromosomes are condensed. Uh, another approach is a microdensitometer, um, which is again staining, and then that takes a reading of the density of the nuclei. Polyploids go beyond um, just producing new polyploid crops. It's also possible to manipulate ploidy levels to, um, to gain new methodologies or new approaches to uh, plant breeding. In the case of anther or microspore culture, this is a technique that's quite widely used um, in plant breeding now as a means of speeding up the development of inbred lines. You may have covered this in the class at this point, you may not, so I will mention it briefly. Um, the microspores are the precursors of the pollen or the haploid male cells of a plant and they can be harvested from the uh, immature anther sacs of a flower. Um, the benefit of this approach is that by harvesting these haploid cells, we can actually regenerate diploid cells because they will, um, at quite a high level, the haploid microspores in culture will reduplicate an additional haploid set of chromosomes, thus producing an immediate inbred line. Because if a haploid set of chromosomes naturally reduplicates 
it means the entire set is going to be homozygous. All genes are going to be homozygous. Um, obviously, it's a technique that you could cover an entire lecture on the process. But the real point of this is that we're going to harvest microspores and through the most part through natural reduplication be able to select homozygous inbred lines. And I put this diagram together to illustrate this in that when we get the chromosomal recombinations, you can see that the two sets of chromosomes, they recombine to produce a haploid set. And I've illustrated the recombinations as a darkened portion of these hypothetical chromosomes. So during the course of um, microspore culture, we will recover double haploids with this haploid set replicates an identical set with identical recombinations. The benefit of this for breeding is obvious because if we look to select inbred lines through self-pollinating, we oftentimes have to self-pollinate the crop six, seven, eight times before we get into a sufficient level of homozygosity to be able to um, use an inbred line in a cross. In the case of microspore culture, we can harvest the microspores and recover double haploids within the period of six months and then increase seed of inbred lines. So we can maybe speed up the development of inbred lines by five or tenfold by using this approach. It's not perfect. It can't be used with all crop types. Um, brassicas, which is a crop that I work with, uh, they are very amenable to chromosomal variations and changes. Um, and so it can be used quite readily in crops like broccoli and canola, and indeed is. Most of the inbred parents of canola are produced through uh, this approach. Most commercial broccoli varieties, uh, the parents are now produced using this approach. Lisa Rill in the Department of Plant Breeding here has worked for a number of years on developing um, double haploids and has worked more recently with Martha Mutchler developing double haploid onion inbred lines and also um, on developing cucurbit uh, double haploids. In the case of canola, it's, um, it's almost the only approach that is used these days. And uh, I was in a canola program in Australia last year, and, and they, add the, they add the culture scene treatment to the stage of developing double haploids. Um, in the case of broccoli, uh, just naturally, you may recover 20 to 80 percent diploids of the embryos that you harvest from this approach. So in the case of broccoli, it's not really necessary to use um, chemicals like colchicine. In the case of canola, it maybe helps a little bit more. But as I said, this is an approach that is only successful or efficient in a small number of plants. Again, it's one of these techniques um, that has come about, as many do over the years, mutation breeding, culture scene doubling, double haploidy, recombinant DNA technology, transformation. Um, oftentimes, some of these approaches have really high level of success in a small number of crop species, but it doesn't mean that they have um, use or utility in all crop species out there. It is necessary to screen um, to identify the polyploids. Uh, flow cytometry is a very good way of doing this. Uh, but if we are producing diploids, in the case of something like anthroculture or microspore culture, 
will typically, if we select the embryos from tissue culture, we'll be able to identify the diploids as being a normal plant type. Uh, the haploids, the aneuploids, and the polyploids will normally have some morphological aberrations of the leaf and the growth pattern. So just by growing the plants out morphologically, we're able to select the diploids. In some cases, because obviously um, the microspores are going on to produce pollen grains that have very low levels of chloroplasts, and of course they don't transmit any chloroplasts, um, in a number of plant species, this can result in um, al albino plantlets because of the lack of chloroplasts in the double haploids that are produced. In this kind of case, it may be possible to rescue them. The approach that can be attempted if uh, microspore culture fails is it sometimes also possible to culture the ovules from the ovaries. So in, in some crop species, it's very difficult to produce normal plants using microspore culture. I believe that rice, if you try and use microspore culture, almost all of the plants are albino because of the chloroplast problems. But it is possible to use ovule culture. Another crop is sugar beet. Uh, it's a lot less efficient than microspore culture and a lot less desirable. And you'd only use this technique if you weren't able to use microspore culture. We also have a problem in that when ovary, or sorry, when ovule or ovary culture is used, is that we can get generation of plants from both the gametophytic and the sporophytic cells, meaning that both the haploid and the diploid cells can regenerate into plants from the ovule or ovary. Um, and so this can add an extra level of inefficiency to ovule culture. But it allows us um, the ability to uh, select and culture not just double haploid, but it's also, if you, were, if you wanted for some reason a haploid plant, you might be able to select that out of this approach, and also a tetraploid. Uh, it may be able to produce an instantaneous tetraploid that is going to have uh, four identical chromosomes um, using this approach, because the chromosomes of the microspore could duplicate and then duplicate a second time. So we'll basically have an inbred tetraploid through this approach. From the consumer standpoint, one of the more interesting manipulations, uh, particularly with horticulture and fruit breeding, is the development of triploids, plants that have three haploid sets. Typically, the triploids have larger fruit they oftentimes have improved flavor, oftentimes improved texture. But the major benefit of triploids is normally in the development of seedless fruits. They are seedless because when they try to generate gametophytic cells, the recombinations of the chromosomes render the seed embryos inviable and you fail to get seeds set. They do, on occasion, occur naturally um, at a relatively low level, although I'm told in apples they can, uh, I think they occur in apples at about three out of a thousand if you were to go out to an orchard. If you were to look at a thousand apple trees, then on average three of them would be triploid. Um, but they can also be created artificially by generating an interspecific cross between a tetraploid and diploid, particularly if you were then able to clonally replicate that triploid uh, that you generate. So um, I put this together 
myself again, just as a means of um, illustrating the issue of sterility in triploids. In the case of triploids, we're almost always going to use um, the tetraploid as the female parent. There are issues with fertilization, and one of them is that because polyploids have bigger cells, uh, they also tend to have bigger pollen grains, for instance. Um, so you can run into issues with traversing the style, for example, just through sheer size. So it's, it's, it's very inefficient to try, and pr to try and cross a tetraploid onto a diploid. You get a very low level of success. You really have to go the other way with the smaller cell onto the bigger cell plant. Um, which does cause a number of problems. So if you have the haploid pollen grain and the diploid ovule, when these produce a triploid, they're just going to have three haploid sets in the F1 hybrid. The F1 hybrid will grow and have a normal plant type as a triploid plant. But if this triploid plant tries to produce uh, gametophytic cells, then these three sets of chromosomes start interacting and recombining with one another. And as the gametophytic cells are produced, you start dealing with a lot of issues like aneuploidy, non-normal gametic uh, haploids. So this is why, in a triploid, the, the embryo um, may start to develop, uh, but typically doesn't go on to produce a seed because it has significant chromosomal aber aberrations going on in it. So while the F1 plant um, does not produce functional gametophytic cells, if it's instigated into fruitin, the fruitin develops out of the ovary. The ovary has the same cells as the maternal plant, which are the three triploid groups. So in the case of something like a seedless watermelon, it would produce a normal fruit type because they are developed off the maternal type with three haploid sets, but the seeds would be distorted and they would not make it through um, to maturity. Which brings me on to watermelon as it is a very good example of breeding triploids and um, one of the uh, biggest efforts in triploid breeding is actually in watermelons. You're probably all aware that um, Watermelon nowadays tends to be more and more of the seedless type as opposed to the seeded type. Consumers don't typically want to spit the seeds out. And this is true of both large and small fruited types. So if you're going to generate a seedless watermelon, how do you do it? Um, it's possible to take a diploid and using chromosome doubling techniques be able to generate tetraploid watermelons. This process is extremely difficult. In fact, it can take well over a decade to produce good tetraploids by um, duplicating the chromosomes of diploids. They have really um, poor fertility and so as a seed parent they're also uh, quite difficult to maintain and use because of these issues but basically through the creation of hybrids in watermelons is you have to have a tetraploid maternal parent because of the inefficiency of trying to cross a tetraploid pollen onto a diploid plant.
So the development of the diploid watermelon is quite straightforward, and you can develop a highly fertile diploid watermelon. This is the traditional status. The development of the tetraploid is extremely difficult. But when you have developed a semi-fertile tetraploid, it's then possible to create F1 hybrids between the diploid and the tetraploid to create seedless triploid watermelons for field production. And this is an example here of two parents used in the creation of the triploid hybrid. Because triploid watermelons do not produce functional pollen, um, you've typically had to plant triploid watermelon varieties with up to 30% of the field being in diploid watermelons to act as pollinators because triploid will not pollinate themselves. They will not produce viable pollen and so they will not act as pollinators among each other. So the approach has been to use up to a third of the field with seeded watermelons. This is why we oftentimes see in stores the large seeded ones with the seedless ones. In the last five to ten years, a different approach has been used with watermelons. And now we use plants known as super pollinators. These are very wild type of watermelon plants. They produce very small fruit about the size of a tennis ball, so they're never going to get mixed up with commercial production. Uh, but they produce um, a lot of pollen. So when a field of seedless watermelons is now planted, the super pollinators are interspersed throughout the field so that they can uh, trigger the pollination event and the fruit development in watermelon. Sometimes the parents as well, to avoid confusion, try to use different rind types, especially if the seeded are going to be mixed up with the seedless, which is not typically the case so much anymore. The, the value of the seed is also very costly for watermelon production. It can be 50 cents to a dollar for one seed. Um, so now these new pure heart watermelons that are on the market uh, are a great thing for both growers and for, um, and for the uh, distribution people because one of these new pure heart watermelons produces a vine that can produce up to nine fruit on it. So when the seed is very expensive, if you can produce nine fruit that retail at four dollars each, then obviously the, the cost impact of that is considerable relative to uh, traditional watermelons or tradi traditional seedless watermelons for that matter, which may only produce one, two, or perhaps three fruit on um, one vine. So the cost benefit analysis of those pure hearts is extremely high. This of course can then be combined with other traits as I've talked about, such as color, in this case, uh, producing a yellow fleshed watermelon. It's also possible to produce purple and orange fleshed watermelon. And that is a picture of one of the smaller ones that you can see in stores these days. In the case of citrus, it's been used quite a lot, um, particularly for the uh, satsuma type of trade in Europe. Um, Sometimes it's possible to select for parthenocarpic citrus varieties to produce seedlessness. Um, if you've got something deliberate that you want to set up, it's also possible to take advantage of triploids again in the production of seedless uh, citrus types. In the case of oranges, uh, tetraploids can occur spontaneously. They can normally be told because their rinds are very thick compared to normal oranges. Um, and it's possible then to select these for crosses to diploids um, where we can produce seedless oranges. As far as determining morphologically, aside from issues like rind type, you can actually just tell by the leaf type uh, because Tetrapoids 
tend to have morphological differences. So in this case, the top row of leaves are diploid citrus plants, and the bottom row are corresponding tetraploid citrus plants. So you can see that the tetraploids tend to have a widened leaf morphology relative to the diploids if you're walking through the citrus grove and looking for tetraploids. From a breeding standpoint, we basically need to select a good tetraploid and a good diploid for this combination. You can see here in the case of the tetraploid, the rind is much thicker, giving us an indication it's a tetraploid. The fruit is bigger, which is typical, and the seed set is lower than your diploid type, which has a higher seed set, smaller fruit size, and thinner rind. By combining the tetraploid with the diploid, it's possible to create an F1 triploid. Um, in this case, the information is, um, is listed at the, at the bottom. This is produced from a diploid mandarin parent um, crossed to a tetraploid sweet orange, producing the triploid hybrid. And of course, as we talked about in fruits, the fact of clonal propagation means that if we can generate a good seedless orange using this approach, then we can just clonally propagate it for production. And people typically prefer to eat seedless oranges or seedless uh, satsumas and seeded ones. Um, they don't always look like this, but they oftentimes do in seed catalogs. In the case of apples, um, it's estimated that 10 to 15 percent of apple varieties are triploid. These include John Gold, uh, Mutsu is um, Crispin, sold in the stores as Crispin, uh, Gravenstein, I think some of the Japanese apples uh, developed out of the program that produced apples like uh, Fuji are also triploid. They tend to have a bigger fruit size, maybe a little bit lower set, but because they can typically have a higher taste profile and a larger fruit size. They can also have a good market value. But triploid apples, relative to how often they occur naturally, um, they tend to have uh, a very high proportion of them are selected for commercial variety production. So triploids occur naturally at the rate of three out of a thousand but they account for 10 to 15 percent of varieties. So basically, triploids are about um, maybe 50 times more likely to be selected as a commercial variety in an apple breeding program. My suggestion was that if, if I had an apple breeding program, I'd, I may concentrate a lot of that on just the selection of triploids at the seedling stage with a flow cytometer because if you're 50 times more likely to produce a variety with a triploid, then maybe it's best to focus half of your program on only looking at triploid apples. You may have a lot of success in variety production if you were to take that kind of approach. As with watermelons, triploids do not produce viable pollen. Apples do need to be pollinated. So because apples are uh, self-incompatible, Typically, you need to plant two apple varieties in an orchard, and the apple varieties will pollinate each other. If you have a triploid that doesn't produce pollen, the triploid will be pollinated by the diploid, but the triploid will not pollinate the diploid. So when you have a triploid, you have to grow it with at least two diploid apple varieties so that everything gets pollinated in the orchard. If all you do is plant two triploids in your orchard, the chances are that you're going to have hardly any pollination occurring. Yeah. So when you see crab apples planted in the orchard, that's just to throw more pollen into the system? They can act as pollinators. Crab apples are planted for a number of reasons in, in Britain.
and they used to make the, the cider out of crab apples, the, the hard cider. So they are used for kind of fermentation and things as well. I'm, I'm not sure what the exact varieties used in the more traditional apple cider is here, but certainly crab apples are used in cider in the UK. Uh, but certainly they could be used as pollinators if, you, if you're working with triploids, that might be a use. Uh, sometimes you get low seed set also if you look in triploid apples and if you plant a triploid apple it's probably not going to germinate if you have a seed in a triploid apple. The other one that's of course is we're all familiar with is um, seedless banana. Um, almost all banana is produced from one type um, which is the Cavendish subgroup. But basically there's two diploid progenitors of the banana group, Acuminata, which has the double A type, and Balbiciana, which has the double B type. The Cavendish subgroup, which is um, almost all of the banana that we're used to eating from the produce side, uh, is a triploid of the Acuminata, which is the three haploid A sets. And then the plantain group um, is a combination between Acuminata and Balbiciana, which has the AAB type. Diploid bananas, of course, are seeded, small, and they wouldn't be particularly popular with the consumer. This is a tetraploid banana on the left, going down to a more natural uh, diploid banana on the right. These are some of the, the bananas that you might see um, in the wild and obviously if you're going to eat a banana you don't want it full of seeds because it's just not very good for the consumer so fortunately a triploid has developed naturally that we've been able to select and market for a number of years because in the case of a diploid if you get pollination you're going to end up with great big seeds in the middle of the banana which you really don't want so what we're more used to is the Cavendish banana, which is a naturally occurring triploid and accounts for almost all of the banana sold worldwide. It is pretty much the same type that was grown um, 100 or 200 years ago. Disraeli, a British prime minister, had a quote that the most delicious thing in the world is a banana, which I'm not sure if everybody agrees with that. Perhaps you have to eat them in their natural environment. But that's all I'm going to cover in the set of lectures that I'm talking about. I, I realize I'm trying to cover quite a lot of information. Um, I'm British. This is a super roundabout in the UK. Uh, Americans have difficulty enough with driving on the left-hand side of the road, let alone with roundabouts. This is actually called a magic roundabout. So it has a large central roundabout, and it has about five or six satellite roundabouts around it. And the odd thing is, is normally you'd go around a roundabout going anti-clockwise, driving on the left-hand side of the road. In this case, you have to go around the satellite roundabouts anti-clockwise, uh, sorry, clockwise. Um, clockwise is the typical direction you go around roundabouts. In this case you go around the satellite ones clockwise and the major one anti-clockwise. So if I've complicated things <laughs> you can always email and ask me some questions about it. Um, I will leave uh, this which I think is on your handout. I, I teach a class every other year on breeding for pest resistance. I think anybody is working with crop improvement it's the, it's the type of class that they should do as a course of their studies. Oftentimes people take many classes where you get a lot of duplication of what you're doing. I do aim to try and cover areas that are important to crop improvement and breeding and things that we're realistically going to deal with. Um, and it's just a two credit class on Monday afternoons. So if any of you are interested in taking that, that will be available next fall. We do tend to take a trip as a class as well, which is quite popular depends on budget and people during the year. Uh, last year we went to Washington, the year before to Florida, but we had a smaller class the year before. So. <laughs>